This is the new 16 inch MacBook Pro, uh, complete with the M1 Pro chip, and um, it's huge. Now, I already gave my first impressions of the 14 inch MacBook Pro in an earlier video, and a lot of what I said about the 14 inch is going to apply to this 16 inch, so I'm not going to cover all those points again because they are very similar. Uh, let's instead quickly talk about the things that are different, and then we'll get into some benchmarks because I know that's what you want. Obviously this is a larger machine with a much larger screen and it does look absolutely massive until you start using it. This uh, additional screen real estate is pretty nice for any serious creative work. Uh, again we've got the mini LED display uh, which looks amazing. The blacks are really black, HDR content looks fantastic uh, and the mini LED can go a lot brighter than OLED panels but there are some trade-offs. Uh, I'm not going to hold this up because my arm's going to get sore. <laughs> the backlighting fall off at the edge of the screen is one of those trade-offs. Uh, this creates a dark area around the edges and I tried to show this on my video with the 14 inch and you can't really see it when you look at the video on YouTube, uh, but you can see it in person, though it's very subtle. Not as obvious as it is on the M1 iPad Pro for instance. Another slight trade-off with mini LED is the blooming effect. So when you have uh, bright whites on a dark background, you kind of get this uh, blooming light effect around it. Um, it's never bothered me personally. In day-to-day -day use, uh, you don't see it, and these are really, really good displays. Now, of course, we do have the notch, and I've already made a separate video about that. So again, I'm not gonna go into it in detail, other than to say that the notch is the same size on both laptops. So that means it takes up proportionately less of the 16 inch display. Uh, though that is a bit like saying that a wart takes up proportionally less of your face. At the end of the day, it's still a wart. Uh, some people like the notch, uh, some don't. What you will find is that you stop noticing it pretty quickly. Uh, something else that's the same size on both laptops is the keyboard, which incidentally delivers an excellent typing experience. Although I will say that the keys do pick up fingerprint grease quite quickly. The trackpad is much bigger on the 16 inch. In fact, it's almost as big as the Magic trackpad. It is as wide and almost as tall. Ports are the same on both models and the speakers sound pretty fabulous, but I don't detect any significant difference between the speakers on the 16 inch model and the 14 inch model, and that's great news. I really like how you can choose a form factor that suits you without having to sacrifice on performance and features. I haven't had chance to fully test the battery life yet. Uh, I did do a couple of days of office work on the 14 inch and I still had 25% battery remaining. So these laptops certainly can deliver long life. And the 16 inch has got room for a bigger battery. So we would expect even better performance from that in spite of the bigger screen. So that's the overall impressions, let's do the fun stuff. Uh, we're trying to test as many combinations of the new chips as we can. Uh, we have the two different M1 Max versions arriving next week, so please support the channel and subscribe. And if you hit the bell, then you'll be notified when that new content arrives. Previously, I tested the entry-level 14-inch MacBook Pro, and that's got the eight-core CPU and 14-core GPU, so losing two cores on each. Uh, this laptop has the full version, so it's 10-core CPU and 16-core GPU, and it's got the same 16 gigs of RAM as before. And these two combinations actually cover all three of the M1 Pro models, as we can see the performance difference from 8 to 10 cores in the CPU and 14 to 16 cores on the GPU. And we've also got results in our benchmarks from the standard M1 with 16 gigs of RAM. That's uh, the Mac Mini behind me. Uh, and I've thrown in a couple more benchmarks since uh, the last video as well. Some of these benchmarks are synthetic and some are actually representative of real world use. So let's start out with one of those, the Affinity Benchmark. Now this benchmark tests the vector graphics performance of the CPU and raster performance of both CPU and GPU. And these scores directly reflect real world work in Affinity Photo and Designer. Now starting with vector performance, we get a score of 529 for single core. And that's the same as the eight core M1 Pro and the standard M1 chip. Uh, but we get a multi-core score of 3,237, and that's a 22% uplift on the 8-core model. Raster performance gets us a CPU score of 939, and that's about 17% improved on that 8-core. For raster GPU performance, we're scoring 17,204. So a 16-core GPU gets you about 12% more performance compared to the 14-core GPU in this test. 
So overall, looking at the combined scores, real-world tasks in Affinity's apps, you can expect the M1 Pro with 10 CPU cores and 16 GPU cores to give you between 9% and 13% performance uplift over that entry-level M1 Pro. And the biggest gains are coming from the CPU. So this is all pretty helpful data for helping us make a purchasing decision. Uh, but first of all, before we draw any conclusions, let's have a look at some more benchmarks. And we want to do some synthetic testing now using Geekbench 5. We get a single core score of 1,766. Again, pretty much identical to the other M1 chips. Multi-core is at 12,569. And this is a big improvement over the 8-core chip. We're looking at a 26% increase here. Though, as we've seen from the Affinity benchmarks, it probably won't translate as much as that into the real world. So now let's take a look at the graphics test in Geekbench. And this is purely a measurement of raw compute performance. And that's not a fair reflection of real world performance for these GPUs. I'll show you why that is in a future video, but basically thanks to those onboard media encoders and the fact that the GPU has access to the entire system RAM, there are some workloads where these GPUs will perform way beyond the level that these scores might indicate. And to be clear, um, gaming is not really one of those workloads. You can certainly tackle some 1080p gaming on the 14 and 16 core GPUs, but there are much faster GPUs available in PC notebooks if gaming is your main focus. The 16 core scores 39,295 in metal, uh, and that's about 7% up on the 14 core GPU. In OpenCL, and remember that these GPUs are not optimized for OpenCL, so we can only use this score to compare M1 GPUs to each other. You cannot compare this score to, say, an NVIDIA card. Uh, that would be a meaningless and incorrect comparison. Uh, nonetheless, the OpenCL score is 33,612, and that's about 8% improvement on the 14-core GPU. So in terms of raw compute power, the two additional GPU cores are not making an enormous difference here. Uh, let's go back to CPU and another real-world test using Cinebench R23. Uh, this tests the CPU's ability to render a 3D scene. And we run the test for 10 minutes to simulate a continuous load. This is a real-world test because it's basically the rendering engine for Cinema 4D. The 10-core M1 Pro scores 12,302, and that represents a 29% increase over the 8-core model. And that's a pretty healthy uplift, to say the least, if you're doing 3D work. Let's see if that also translates to Blender. I'm rendering the BMW scene using CPU and then again with GPU. The 8-core M1 Pro took 4 minutes 17 seconds, but the 10-core does it in 3 minutes 21 seconds, so that's... Uh, almost a minute faster, and if my math is correct, I think that's a 28% increase again, so uh, pretty consistent with the Cinebench results. GPU rendering is slower. The 14-core GPU rendered that same BMW scene in 5 minutes 22 seconds, and the 16-core GPU took 4 minutes 57 seconds, so that's around an 8% improvement. Again, fairly consistent across all these results. Now bear in mind that the M1 Max chips will have similar CPU performance, but they'll offer 24 and 32 core GPUs. And I wonder if that top 32 core GPU will be able to render this scene faster than the CPU. Uh, we'll certainly test that when it arrives. Another interesting CPU plus GPU test is Blackmagic's RAW playback benchmark. This is looking at the performance for playing various types of B-RAW video. Uh, and the test is running under Rosetta, so true performance may be just slightly higher. So when we look at 8K B-RAW, uh, we're getting six additional frames per second compared to the 8-core CPU, so that's a 29% uplift. Uh, using the GPU, we're scoring 160 frames per second, and that's actually 22% better than the 14-core GPU. Very impressive. Finally, let's take a look at the 3D Mark Wildlife Extreme Benchmark. And this is actually designed for iOS, but it runs on Apple Silicon so we can run it in macOS. And it does provide some useful comparison metrics. The standard M1 Mac Mini scored 5,069 with an average frame rate of 30.4. Uh, the entry-level M1 Pro with its 14-core GPU scores 9,126 with an average frame rate of 54.6. And the M1 Pro with the 16-core GPU scores 10,223 at 61.2 frames per second. And that's a 12% improvement over the 14-core GPU. So when it comes to choosing between the three M1 Pro chip variants, uh, we can draw some conclusions. 
First of all, if you want a 16 inch chassis, there's only one choice. Uh, you get the M1 Pro with 10 CPU cores and 16 GPU cores, as we've been testing today. But if you prefer the 14 inch model, there is that choice of three. Over the entry model for an additional $200, you can have two additional CPU cores. Does that represent good value? It depends which software you'll be using. Uh, can it take advantage of that additional multi-threaded performance? Not all apps can. Uh, it's one thing to have the performance available, it's another thing to actually be able to use it all. However, if your workload will benefit, like with the 3D rendering we've seen, then it is probably a good choice. The 16-core GPU comes at an upgrade price of $300 over the entry option or a further $100 over the middle choice there. And as we've seen, it doesn't provide a massive graphics performance gain, except in the B-Raw playback test. I will provide some more insights when we've done more real-world showdowns, but for now, let's finish up by looking quickly at SSD performance. The 16-inch notebook that I have here has the 1TB SSD, and typically larger SSDs are faster, and that is the case here, at least for write performance. It scores a massive 5,898 megabytes per second. Uh, read performance though is the same as the 512 model, so not quite the speeds that Apple quoted, but plenty fast enough. In my next video, I'm going to be taking a look at external USB storage speeds. Does the M1 still lag behind Intel, or has Apple finally fixed it? And what about Bluetooth and Wi-Fi performance? Uh, external displays? I'm going to try and cover all of those things in uh, one video. Uh, and Pete and I will be chatting about these new machines, and uh, specifically looking at the difference between the 16-inch we've looked at today and the previous Intel model. And we'll be doing that in this week's podcast. Uh, that'll be coming out on Tuesday, 2nd of November, on our separate podcast channel. That's uh, youtube.com forward slash The Constant Geekery Podcast. And our first M1 Max model is due to arrive in a few days. So I'll be testing the difference between 16 and 32 gigabytes of RAM, and also seeing what that 24 core GPU can deliver. So, lots to come. Don't forget to subscribe. And thanks in advance for all of your comments, your shares, and your likes, or dislikes. See you again soon for some more geekery. <laughs>